I'll hand it over to um, our executive director, uh, Malcolm Warner. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. Um, can we um, move to the first image, please, Robert? The, um, the one of the, yes, that one. Well, welcome everybody virtually to Laguna Art Museum. This is a view inside our gallery where, uh, until we had to close recently, um, we had on display this strange apparition of a work that looks very much like a, a concrete freeway barrier, but it's not, it's actually a painting incredibly enough. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, that strange uh, duality in the work of um, Dan Duquet uh, as we go along here. I first saw his work in an exhibition at the, at the museum in 2013. We had a show called Faux Real. Um, and um, it was a revelation really. I hadn't known much about Dan before. And um, he definitely emerged as the star of that show. And I've been thinking about his work a lot ever since and how it fits into certain traditions. There's the, the, the tra tradition of trompe l'oeil, fool the eye, that goes back at least to the Dutch painters of the 17th century and uh, even before that, where the object of the work of art is partly the thrill of um, extreme um, truth to reality. Um, you can see his connection to Dada too, that early 20th century so-called anti-art movement. And Dan indeed remembers fondly seeing the work of one of the great champions of Dada, Marcel Duchamp, um, in um, the Pasadena Art Museum when he was a student at the uh, Pasadena City College in the 1960s. Um, then there's photorealism. Some of uh, Dan Duquet's early work consists of um, photorealist paintings. And um, you could almost see works like the one we're looking at here as um, like a translation of photorealist painting into sculptural form. But all that said, um, none of that really explains the haunting, mysterious quality of uh, Dan Duquet. Um, people want to know, so it's so real, is it a work of art? Um, um, perhaps most of all, why would anyone want to do that? Um, there's a, a certain anxiety, as Peter Mendenhall has pointed out about uh, Dan's work, but also I would say a, a great deal of humor too. It's, uh, it does make you smile. And the reason I wanted to show you this particular work um, to kick off our session is that I have such happy news to, to uh, break, which is that um, Dan has uh, generously offered this work of art to the museum's collection as a gift and we couldn't be happier. And uh, we'll talk even more about it later because it's now my, my favorite uh, work in the collection for the time being. And also, um, you know, a masterpiece uh, even amongst Dan's wonderful works. Well, with that, um, I'll uh, um, hand over to Robert Hayden, scholar and collector of California art, who's um, a long time admirer of uh, Dan Duque, and I think he's gonna um, say, say a bit about uh, Dan's early development. Thank you, Malcolm. I'll, I'll be brief so that we can have the artist talking, which is what we're all really here for. But um, the, tonight we're gonna look at some of Dan's work over the many decades of his career. And I have up for you one of his earliest um, paintings called Cascade from 1977. This is actually, as I just said, a painting. It looks like a piece of cardboard that's been splattered with paint, almost like in an abstract express, expressionist style. But in fact, it, it is a painting of cardboard yeah. that fools the eye, as Malcolm mentioned earlier. And here's another example, Dan's Fry from 1977. And Dan, if you don't mind sharing um, with yeah, us that's, that's, that's what, um, what your thoughts are about this painting, how you began working in painting that look like cardboard. And if I may, before Dan starts, um, if everybody could make sure that their microphones are muted, that would be wonderful so we don't have people talking in the background over here. Thank you. Uh, the, the painting Fry came about uh, after 
just before my first show in New York, which was 1975. In 1975, my first show in New York was photorealist paintings of Southern California swimming pools. I thought I needed to get some boots because the opening was in the winter time. So I bought a box, I mean, I bought a pair of fry boots and they came in a box, a white cardboard box. And this is the bottom of the box that I painted that my boots came in for, so I could go to New York for my first show. <laughs> While I was in New York in 1975, it seemed like every gallery in New York was showing photorealism. Then and there I said, well, I have to evolve into something else. And this was the next painting after I returned. So Dan, this show was at the OK Harris Gallery, right? Would you no, it was at another gallery. See if I can remember the name of it. <laughs> Um, Warren Benedict Gallery, long gone now. Okay, okay. But and surely, then, surely thereafter you joined OK Harris, which was headed I by... Went, I went from Warren Benedict to the uh, Carlo Lamanga Gallery. Carlo had worked at Ivan's and opened a gallery across the street. And I went, and they asked me if I would show with them, so I did. And then when I went back for that show, I, of course, walked across and talked to Ivan, and he said, you should really be over here, you know. <laughs> and the, the rest is history. As and the say. rest, so I, I made the move. So after doing cardboard, you then transition into metal. And what we're looking at here is, again, a painting. This is a painting on canvas. But the painting looks as if it's a sheet of metal. And I, I've seen these installed on the walls. It looks literally like uh, a ton, you know, a sheet of metal that would weigh a ton. And people, when they look at it, try to figure out how in the world is that wall supporting such a heavy thing? Because it literally does fool the eye. It, 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 it carries the illusion of mass and heavy weight. The images that I painted of cardboard boxes carried the illusion of, of the lightness and some kind of fragility. And I wanted to do something that looked more solid and substantial and unrelenting. So I, came, I thought, well, I'll paint images of steel. So that's how that came about. And I so painted all those paintings. Is the 92014 a nod to your zip code at the time? <laughs> it's just a random number that I made up. OK. <laughs> So then um, another body of work that you completed shortly thereafter was you created large scale uh, reproductions, if you will, of cigar boxes, which is an example we see here with La Gloria Cubana. And That's I'm, wo I'm wondering if Malcolm can also weigh in on this because I love the fact that you have like a Baroque style 17 or 18th century painting it's an allegory of peace on top of this box that you've somehow incorporated a, a reference back to, you know, to older work into a contemporary work of art. Mm -hmm. It was uh, my New York art dealer, Ivan Karp, that introduced me to cigars. He's a avid cigar smoker. And one time when I was back there for a show, he said, I'm going to take you to paradise. <laughs> and he took me to a cigar shop. So uh, I was fascinated with the, the Baroque type images on the boxes. I was painting uh, cardboard boxes, which were more industrial looking. And I said to myself, well, these are boxes too. Why don't, maybe I could do those. So I bought a box of cigars. I gave all the cigars to Ivan. And I brought the box back and made a painting of it. Mm. And that's so, how that um, it's interesting to me that it's um, that it is the kind of painting on the box that um, is a a show of illusionism. You know, the artist who created this um, mm -hmm. will have taken a pride in the way that the uh, the foreshortening gives you the illusion of the, the figures being somewhat above above you, almost like it's uh, they're on the on the ceiling or up in heaven, and we're looking yes. up at them. So um, it's an interesting like. Um, exposition of two different stages of illusionism, um, one belonging to a previous era, the Baroque era, but then you've, you've taken it into a whole new realm 
um, by uh, reproducing um, not just the a sort of um, plausible illusion of some figures on a figures up in the air, but uh, ac an actual object that looks so totally um, indistinguishable from um, the real thing. I like the way you think, Malcolm. <laughs> 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 so next, let's take a look at uh, a, a, from from the 17th and 18th century into the 20th century in technology. What what about this iMac box, Dan? Well, you can see the date on it was 1999, and I think I actually acquired that box to use as a model to make this painting, which you're looking at the picture of in 1998, which was the millennium change. And there was a lot of talk about the unknown and what was going to happen at the millennium. And there was this kind of uh, uh, fanciful idea that the computer was going to take over the world. And I thought that was ridiculous. So that's why I wanted to paint the computer. I liked the way it was packaged and sent out to the world. And so I started making paintings of computer boxes. And this is one of the early ones. I think there probably are still some people who um, may be new to your work who still can't believe that these are actually paintings because um, this looks so much just like a computer box. But we'll we'll get soon. We'll soon have a reveal, won't we, where we can yes. see. Here we uh, go. As here. Yeah, here we go. But the, <laughs> it's not so, the real. So with this painting, GTX, this I was uh, talking to Malcolm earlier today about this. It's kind of like... For those of you that live in Laguna Beach, going to the, the, the pageant of the masters and seeing the paintings on the stage, you, you know, behind the curtain, and then all of a sudden they turn up the theater lights, move the side curtains away, and you see that it's not a painting. It is, in fact, people posing on the stage. And the same kind of thing happens here. When you see the backside of Dan's paintings, you realize, wow, that's not an old cardboard box. That's a painting on canvas. I thought of uh, when I, I made when I made first made these paintings, these illusionistic paint, three dimensional paintings, I thought uh, it would be more interesting to show them in such a way that the viewer could see the reverse or the back of the box to understand what they were looking at, because they were painted so well, so convincing that they would have been dismissed just as found objects that were placed on the floor. So, um, and, and my New York art dealer, Ivan, liked that idea too. <laughs> hmm. As he sold the entire so, show. So, Dan, what, what, do you, what do you say to people who, um, who just say, well, why don't you just put a box out there? <laughs> What's, why, do you, why do you go to all that trouble? Why not just put, a, put an actual box out there? I like to process stuff through the human body and uh, it, it, it changes it the nuances, at least for me, uh, just the a found object is not the same as a handmade painting, whether it looks like a cardboard box or the Sistine mm -hmm. Chapel ceiling. Mm -hmm. So Jan Dan, on the screen now, I have an image, an installation view of a show that you had at the Peter Mendenhall Gallery. And That's in, correct. in this particular, um, in this particular image, there's three paintings that I'd like to show in more detail. We have here um, Dow, which is a painting of uh, a, an insulation board used in, in home construction. We have To and From, which are a series of um, cor like st or corrugated metal, or not corrugated, but called galvanized metal. Thank you, galvanized metal mailboxes. And everything you see here is painted. Um, this is not, you know, you, you use the resin to make the weld marks. That's you correct. Use the resin to make the handle for the mailbox. Every, right. and, then, and then you paint it to look like metal. That's correct. And then we have Cor Corey's from 2008, a box of, uh, Slug and snail poison. <laughs> exactly. So the, the interesting thing to me about this particular installation, and if you'll indulge me for one second, um, it looks like a, 
a installation of minim minimalist art objects. And it, um, I, I, if I can, for a second, geek out on art history, for just a, a 30 seconds, uh, and quote from Donald Judd's Specific Objects essay from 1965, which is kind of like the touchstone of minimalism. And Judd, Judd said, quote, some things can be done only on a flat surface. Lichtenstein's, re referring to Roy Lichtenstein, the painter, Lichtenstein's representation of a representation is a good instance, close quote. And I find that so fascinating because here you are making a representation of a representation, but it is in the three dimensions. It's not a flat surface in contrast to what Judd, that Judd is saying. So were you playing with minimalism here? Absolutely. I wanted to tweak Don's uh, thinking, <laughs> even though he wasn't around any longer. I was a great uh, fan of minimalism. So you, you see the influence in my work, even though I don't think of myself as a minimalist, I'm more like a maximalist. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, this is another painting that I absolutely love. Um, at Pretz from 2008, and I have a detail in the next screenshot. And you can see the perforation mark where you would rip open the box to get at the, the, can, the sweet treats inside. Dan has even recreated that. And this, as I understand, the box, the actual box of treats, the real treats, was a gift to you from one of your students. And you, just to explain to everybody that you were um, an art professor at Cal State University Long Beach for 32 years. And 30, 32 years, that's correct. But it was uh, Cal State University Los Angeles, not Long Beach. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. And what, one of your students gifted you this box, Kaz Oshiro. That's correct. He is a Japanese American. And so you then turned the box into this painting. That's correct. So That's what correct. does it mean to you to be a teacher? Well, I am no longer a teacher, but at the time it meant that I had 35 smiling, eager faces staring at me three times a day willing to listen to everything I had to say. And uh, this particular student, Kaz Oshiro, listened very well. <laughs> yeah, and he, he has risen to acclaim himself and works similarly in a trompe l'oeil style to you, although his objects are quite different than the objects that you typ typically do. Yeah, he's excellent. He's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question about your technique, uh, Dan? Mostly, yes. mostly um, with the, the trompe l'oeil artists of the past that I'm more familiar with, um, you, you can see them getting better at it as they go along. You know, they start and it's a little bit clunky, maybe not, as, not so convincing, but um, they, get, they master it eventually. Whereas you, you seem to have just hit upon this fully formed. You know, you're so good at it right from the beginning. Was there some kind of breakthrough that you had that uh, where you suddenly realized you could like represent the, the perforations on a cardboard box with such uh, incredible accuracy? As I mentioned earlier, after I returned from my first show in New York in 1975, I knew I was finished with making photorealist paintings. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And uh, I, I would, I lived on a, like in a commercial building that a front of an alley and I would pick up, I was always kicking cardboard out of my walkway to get into my living space. So one day I just said, well, this is the stuff. It's here. It's available. This is what I'll make art out of. But I didn't want to just use it as the material. So I, I made uh, paintings of it instead. That was the inspiration. Mm. Mm. That's how it started. I do, uh, at one of my early shows at OK Harris of the cardboard boxes, uh, a collector came up to me and looked around the room and stared me in the eye and said, you do everything the hard way, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so do you use, um, do you use airbrush or? Um, I, use, I, I do use airbrush a lot. 
when I was 14 years old, my grandmother gave me an airbrush thinking it was a fountain pen. <laughs> and I wasn't sure what to do with it. I didn't use it until I was in high school. I painted something on a white t-shirt and wore it to school. And I was amazed at the reaction that it got. Uh, some students were like lining up to have me paint their shirts. So I became sort of, I, I gained some kind of weird popularity through my art. So I painted t-shirts with the airbrush for when I was 15 <laughs> years old. Ah. So Dan, with this painting, you, you, we've talked about your cardboard boxes, we've talked about your metal paintings, and here we're looking at what looks like massive wood planks. That's right? true. Um, but in fact, it's a painting. It, it's, yeah, there's nothing behind it but stretcher bars. And it's a painting of what looks like solid, substantial material. And kind of like the metal paintings, except now it's wood. I was taken with the, uh, with the complexity of, of painting something as simple as a piece of wood. And I thought, well, if I could paint one, I might as well stack up five of them and do five. <laughs> That's how that came about. I like to make it uh, harder than it should be. <laughs> er earlier, you mentioned how um, it's important for you as an artist to have your hand involved in the making of an, of an object. And that seems to be referenced in the objects that you make too, because you see the human touch. You see where these boards have been banged up. You see where stickers have been applied and then tried, you know, ripped off. On the boxes, you see where they've been rubbed and used. Are, are you, is, is that, you know, why are, why are you not painting perfect objects? Why do you do the used objects? Because all of the objects in the world are objects that have been touched and handled by the human species. And I'm interested in the, the residue that that leaves on the object. I'm not interested in the perfect object. I'm interested in the object that has been touched and handled by a human being. And I want to incorporate that aspect into the painting. I don't know if it means anything to anybody other than myself. <laughs> so when you display these in a gallery setting or when they're owned by museums and museums display them, do you like to have the, the verso, the reverse of the work available for people to access? I prefer if they can see the back of it. That's my preference. But I, if I walk into a gallery or a museum and they don't have that uh, available, I never go up and tell them they've got to change things around. Mm -hmm. But I prefer where the viewer, because something happens, because the viewer thinks they're seeing this, this pile of wood, this stack of wood. But when they go to and see the back, their reality is shattered. They're not seeing what they thought they were seeing. And I like that, that shift in consciousness to occur. That's great. So is it, uh, is it intended to be unsettling or, or comical? Unsettlingly comical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Dan, your sense of humor is shown in this particular painting, which incorporates the painting we just looked at, incorporates we, onto the cover of what appears to be an auction catalog from the Christie's Auction House. Although this is not a book, this is, again, a painting. If we were to flip it over, you'd see the canvas stretcher bars. Tell me about your use of humor here. Why, why did you put yourself on the cover of an auction catalog? Well, as you are probably aware, all of the, quote, highly successful artists' work usually ends up in the auctions. And they always put a, a significant, important work on the cover. Well, I just don't have time to wait for art history to catch up. So I <laughs> thought I would, I would make my own. <laughs> And Dan, I'd love uh, just a point of reference behind you on the wall. I see T 
two of your paintings, two of your wood paintings hanging on the wall right behind you. Um, That's true. Maybe a little hard to make out for some of the viewers, but they have, just like you, if you went to a construction yard and you'd see rows and rows of lumber, oftentimes in the yard, the edge, the ends of the lumber are spray painted a specific color that denote, I don't know, something to construction people. And so you have the end of that, um, piece of wood, one of them is painted kind of a turquoise blue and the other one is like a reddish. That's exactly right. When I would make a painting, I'd first have to go to the lumber yard to get the, the lumber, the wood, to make the stretcher bars. And you're absolutely right about the color. They color coded all of the ends of the wood and nobody ever knew what they meant. <laughs> Are so you that's sort of the inspiration. Or you don't know either. I don't know what that yeah. what color <laughs> means. I was only interested in the appropriate sizes. Dan, you, you seem to be um, like uh, really um, devoted to the, the lowbrow, ordinary kind of object. I know, for example, I know you play the guitar and uh, that's an exciting object. And yeah, I don't know if you've made any any representations of, uh, of anything like that, a guitar. And certainly you haven't done anything highbrow or expensive. You haven't done a, you've never done a tiara. <laughs> it, tends, it tends to be um, objects of, of um, almost uh, like willful uh, ordinariness, um, especially striking when you see them in a, in a, in a fancy art gallery or, or museum context. Is that something to do with uh, with your, your um, early exposure to Marcel Duchamp, for example? I did see uh, Marcel Duchamp, I believe in 1963 at the Pasadena Art Museum. I was raised in the city, city of Pasadena, so I went to the Pasadena Art Museum quite a bit. Um, but uh, it probably had a, a, an influence on me, but that wasn't the reason I, I, I picked what I call common, um, objects to paint. I never thought it would be meaningful or have any kind of uh, thrust if I was painting a tiara, to use your example, <laughs> because making a fake diamond is something that uh, I didn't want to do. So I wanted to select something that when you look at it, you go, well, nobody would you know, ever make a, a recreation of this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it had to be common. <laughs> hmm. And that would seem to be true for this so-called relay box, which is the mailboxes that the post people use That's in true. neighborhoods to like dump the whole neighborhood's mail in and then it's from there delivered to individual houses. That's correct. So in, normally inside this would be a whole bunch of messages or letters, and, but yet you've moved the messages to the outside of the box here. Um, through the stickers. Through the stickers, that's correct. That's a good interpretation of it. I had some, I have some friends that live in Aspen, Colorado, which is a famous ski community. And they had an art fair in Aspen, Colorado. And Peter Mendenhall, my Pasadena art dealer, said, I'm going to the Aspen art fair. Would you be interested? So I said, oh yes, but, you know, I wanted to go and visit my friends. And, so while I was walking around Aspen, I noticed that all of their public mailboxes and relay mailboxes were covered with these stickers that the kids had put on there. And I liked that idea that, just as you pointed out, that inside were the messages, but on the outside, there was also messages. <laughs> and many of the stickers are autobiographical in a way, aren't they, Dan? I mean, they seem to say messages about your life in some of them. Well, which ones, for example? Not the Zumba, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you're not a yoga fan either then. I'm not big on yoga. And if, you kill, if I killed my TV, I wouldn't know what the heck to do. And I love sugar. <laughs> Maybe not so autobiographical. <laughs> Let's look at another work. Uh, this is a recent work uh, from last year titled Safe, 
which I find fascinating, not only for the painting within the painting, which I'd love for you to share with us the story behind the landscape painting on the safe first. Well, as you pointed out earlier, I've been making paintings that had paintings on them, starting with the cigar boxes. So this is just another variation on that theme. I had a show in uh, Reno, Nevada, and I stayed at a casino hotel called The Legacy, and they had a huge uh, display of silver and silver wealth, and in that display was this old turn-of-the-century safe uh, where they used to store the silver for, for safety, and I was taken with the idea that it's nothing more than a box, referred to as a strong box, and I was inspired to make a painting of it, and then the painting that I saw in the, in the uh, casino did not have a landscape on it. So I selected what I thought would look like a 19th century landscape, kind of almost like a beard stat, and painted that on the door. I invented it, in other words. What about the, the um, dial, the safe's dial and the handle? How did you make that? I went and I bought a paddle lock and I made a, uh, a rubber mold of the paddle lock and then I cut the, the part at the top off and then I poured resin in it and then I painted the resin to look like metal and I put the black center on it and that's what the combination is made out of and the turn, the handle is made out of wood. Mm. It's there's amazing. a lot of there's a lot of such a lot of painstaking work involved, in, especially in a, a large piece like this. Yes. Um, do you have you ever used assistance? In 1974, I tried, and it <laughs> lasted it lasted like an hour. <laughs> I was disappointed in their work ethic and their capabilities. <laughs> Is the, is the sheer amount of work that you put into a piece like this, is that part of its, um, part of its meaning in a way? You think I never think about the amount of work when I make a work of art, mm -hmm. um, but you, it, it could be. I don't know, yeah. I don't think about that. Yeah, it's one aspect to the, um, what, what for, a, for a want of a better word, I, I sort of call the absurdity of your work. You know, it's what, what that that there is so much, there's so much effort involved in creating this this uh, uh, it's what not, appears to be an ordinary object. It's uh, it's not a found object. That's for darn sure. It's conceptual <laughs> art. That's more than throwing scraps on the floor. Yeah, yeah. So Dan, in your barricade with skid marks that we saw at the beginning of this presentation installed in the Lagoon Art Museum Gallery, um, talk to us, if you will, about why the skid marks are there on the barricade. Well, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. There's probably more barricades in this city than any other city in the world, with the exception of possibly New York. So I've as many, as almost all of us do, we see these everywhere, but we don't really think about them. We look at them, but we don't, they don't really penetrate our consciousness. Um, and they're meant to stop an automobile, which many of them do. And I like the, the way um, the automobile tire left res what appears to be residue or mark making. Art to me, it's nothing more than mark making on a surface. So this looked like something that was mark making on a surface and that's why I wanted to make it. Mm. And so that's how that particular painting came about. Mm. It's so wonderful that you've, uh, you've get, can we go back to that one again, Robert? Uh, yeah. it's and I'll, such show, a, I'll show the back. While oh you're yeah, fantastic. So wonderful. I know that you, you think that um, at the museum we might be able to use it for crowd control if necessary. <laughs> when, when I first showed this painting, I think it was at the Peter Mendenhall Gallery when he was on uh, w w Wilshire Boulevard, 
at the, his gallery then was much smaller than it is now. And I told him, I only want to exhibit this piece and nothing more. And he wasn't so happy about that. <laughs> and furthermore, I said, I wanted to put it right in the front door so nobody could get in the gallery. And he was definitely not happy about that idea either. <laughs> so uh, I allowed him to put it at the back of the gallery and to uh, include a few more works. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Peter because um, Peter Mendenhall, what a what a, what a wonderful um, dealer he, and patient uh, gallerist for you to to work with. Um, yes, he is it's wonderful. Uh, even it, it, with all your uh, reluctance to create anything sellable. <laughs> <laughs> all of my dealers have had trouble with that. <laughs> you should have heard some of the conversations we've had, especially with Ivan. They were hilarious. <laughs> Did they have they um, have they tended to push you towards the smaller, more kind of tabletop pieces rather than something like this? There has been pressure brought to bear, but I've resisted it every time. <laughs> good, good for you, Dan. One <laughs> of the things that's so fascinating about this particular painting is that not only the skid marks that are on. On, that you painted onto them, which you've you've painted onto them, That's but right. how the chip marks on the corners, how the bit, the concrete has chipped away, and so what we're seeing is the the you know the not smooth part of the concrete, the rocks that are mixed in to solidify the concrete. You've yes you've perfectly created that in the in this sliced away. Uh, you know, section on the on the lower part of the barricade, and then again up at the top part. Well, before I made this painting, I would drive along, and when I'd see barricades, I'd pull off to the side of the road, get out of the car, and go look at them. And they were all chipped up, banged up. So I thought, well, I have to make chips and you know breaks in mine. So what I did was I. I made a cement blocks from myself for myself, and then I beat them with a hammer until they were broken. Then I made rubber molds of the brake marks, and then I would literally paint paint into the mold, pull the paint out, and then when I'm making a painting such as a barricade with skid marks, I would then in incorporate that part of the painting into the larger painting. That's how that came about. So it was also, not the, I'm sorry. That's all, I'm finished. Also on display at the museum are these two works that on paper, which I've never seen of yours before, work on paper. What, how did black wall and white wall come about? I have lots of work on paper. They've never been exhibited. Um, well, I think it was shortly after the barricade painting. I'm not even close, a long time, 15 years later, 16 years later. I'm still thinking about the marks on the barricade and it was, they were made with tires. So now I'm, I made drawings, works on paper of the tires. That's how they came about. But I didn't want to make just tires. So I kind of elongated them. And I would tell everybody that they're not really tires they're designs for surfboards. <laughs> That's why I thought they'd be good for the Laguna Beach Art Museum. But you probably <laughs> didn't know that until this minute. No, well, we'll, um, we'll put that on the label from now on. <laughs> okay. So, Malcolm, should we open this up to people's questions? Um, <laughs> That would be a good, this would be a good moment, I think, yes. Yeah, so what we're asking everybody to do since we're in this Zoom environment and we have a number of people on this um, presentation with us, it would be overwhelming to have everybody unmute their screens and try to ask Dan questions all at once. So we're asking to, for you to please um, use the chat feature in, um, in Zoom to send us messages. And then I'll go ahead and relay the messages to Dan. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Dan, please use 
um, the chat feature to type a message to to uh, to us, and we will ask Dan. So, um, Dan, let me read um, a message from Catherine. She writes, I have found the reveal really does profoundly change the viewer's perception of your work. When did you start showing the reveal on your paintings? Was that early on or did it come later? The first time I showed the illusionistic paintings was with the OK Harris Gallery in New York, which is run by Ivan Carr. And we hung all of the work up on the walls and placed them around the floor. And both he and I walked around the gallery and he said, nobody's gonna believe this. Nobody's gonna believe what they're seeing. So I went up to one that was on the floor and I turned it around and I said, how's that? <laughs> so they could, and he said, that works great. <laughs> That's how it came about. This isn't a question, but a comment. Um, Holly, uh, kudos to you, Dan. Holly says, your work is brilliant and hearing you speak about them has been wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. <laughs> so we have a question from Marinta. Dan, do you have some amusing anecdotes of people mistaking your pieces for the real thing? Uh, maybe to some they're amusing. To me, they weren't amusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in a uh, traveling museum show, and it opened at uh, USC, University of Southern California's art galleries. It was a long time ago. It was organized by Don Brewer, and it went to the Denver Art Museum and to a number of other museums. And I think that I, I had a painting of a cardboard box, and Don Brewer called me after the opening and said, somebody took the box painting off the wall and it appears to be gone. So I went down to the gallery and we looked around and the uh, custodians had taken it off the wall and put the trash from the opening inside of it and put it in the storeroom. <laughs> So I thought that was like a compliment in a weird way. <laughs> and then one time in New York, I'm going to have to consult with my wife briefly on this. There was something happens. Oh, yeah. This is great. <laughs> this is my first or second. This is my first or second show at OK Harris in New York. And there were always a lot of students going through the galleries in Soho. And they had a lot of attitude, of course. So they never would spend time with, if they walked into a room, they gave it like a split second and it would either pass or fail with them. One of them decided that my, my work had failed and they took a, a felt tip pin and wrote, this is shit. <laughs> However, the, the the trouble was that all the Ivan had sold all of the work, including the painting that the guy wrote on. So I told the collector who was there that night that I would repair it. And he said, only if you leave a little bit of this, this is shit sticking out of the, and I said, okay, we'll do it that <laughs> way. Dan, Catherine would like to know what you're working on now. I've been doing a lot of drawing on paper. Um, I don't always have an idea. I mean, a good idea worth spending a lot of time on. They come around, that doesn't come around too often. So if I start working on paper and drawing and just running lots of ideas through my brain, I can start to see what would be the best idea out of this group. And then that would be the one that I will make a painting of. So at this point, I'm looking for a good idea. <laughs> Maybe I can ask people to send them to you via chat. <laughs> that would be nice. So Bernadette, right. Bernadette asks, can you elaborate on what interests you about the human mark 
on surfaces. In other words, what is not interesting about a surface unmarked by the human touch? That it's boring. <laughs> it's just simply boring to me. I think that the human being is infinitely more interesting. What they do, the residue that they leave, is more fascinating than a pristine white box, for example. I love the work of Donald Judd. I saw him when I was a young student at the Pasadena Art Museum, but I was always bothered by the pristine quality of the work, the untouched quality of, of what I saw. So I like the uh, fact that they were these common objects, boxes. So I just took the idea of the box and ran with it in my direction. That's wonderful. Mary asks, wh which work gave you the most trouble? <laughs> the barricade. <laughs> well, then that's all the more special reason that it did it to now in the Lagoon Art Museum collection. Yes. No, it was not easy to make that painting. In fact, that's the sec that was the second attempt at that painting. The first attempt I was not happy with. So I took a chainsaw to it after I'd worked on it for six months, which was really difficult to do. But I was not about to let it out of the studio. So I cut it up and I said, I'm not gonna do this again. Well, the next painting I started, of course, was another barricade. <laughs> so was that a real chainsaw or a, or a fictive one? It was one of those cheap electric ones. <laughs> That's all you need to cut through canvas. So you, did, you didn't make it yourself? The chainsaw, no, it was a real chainsaw. <laughs> Dan, before I um, ask you the next question, I'll share a comment with you from Kara and Bob Geinder, who say, it's wonderful to see you and hear you speak about your work. It's been a while since we've seen you. Love to you and Nadine from fellow O.K. Harris artists. That's <laughs> wonderful that they're listening. Hi to Bob and Kara. Thank you for listening. So Sarah, Sarah asks, Dan, is there something you really want to paint that you haven't yet figured out how to? I have enough technical ability to paint anything that I can imagine and almost anything that I can see, but it has to be something that speaks to me. I can't uh, explain what that quality is. I know it when I see it. I haven't seen it in a while. And it, it can't be fancy. It has to be more common or ubiquitous. So this is an insider comment apparently um, from Catherine who says, Dan, please paint a picture of the 45 record from your band, The Sessions. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? I have two copies left. I'll give her one, tell her, <laughs> if she wants to be tortured. <laughs> so that's where the guitar comes in, apparently. I have a guitar. I'd be glad to bring it to the museum and torture everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Fritz would like to know, how long do your works take? Contrary to your comment, I think Lots about barricade since my sig alert on the 405. So wonderful that Lamb has your wonderful piece. So how long do your works take you typically? They, they take months. Some take as little as two or three months. Others take up to six months or longer. I only make three paintings a year. Wow. Yeah, that's my output. So three major paintings, do you squeeze yeah. in some smaller well, ones in between? I do squeeze some smaller things in and I always, I'm always working in a sketchbook too. So Caleb asks uh, or says, when I look at your work, I can't help but think about stage and prop design. Have you ever thought about your work in a performative way? No, I have not. But in some extent, you talking about the need to exert the humanness of create, creating a work of art is a performance, although it's a performance that maybe only you get to see in your studio. 
That's true. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles, which has, it's an industry town. What's the industry? Hollywood, movies, make-believe. That was a big influence on me. In what way? I mean, it's obvious that your your work is make believe, but what, what? How do you? How did that link from Hollywood and make believe tra transfer into your art? Well, I, I went. You know, I saw a lot of movies, and uh, while I was watching them, I always was conscious that this is not real. This is this is a fabrication that somebody made, and I, I would have conversations with my friends about that. And they were not interested in talking about that aspect of the movies, but it, it was totally fascinating for me. So I thought, well, I'll make my own little movie. I'll make a prop or I'll make an, art, an artwork. But, but you're, not, you're not too far off when you say there's a relationship between prop making and, and what I do. Although if you've seen movie props, they're basically pretty crude. Mm. I, in other words, you say you're better. You're you're saying you're better than a prop maker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> those are your words. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. I take more time. I work for myself and not the studios. Yeah. So your fellow artist um, at the Peter Mendenhall Gallery, Kenton Nelson, asks, "Do you work uh -oh. on several pieces at once?" No, one piece at a time. I stay focused, Kenton, just like you. <laughs> All right, Malcolm, do you have anything else? That looks like that's the end of the questions. Ah, um, no, except to say uh, thank you to you, Robert, um, but m even more to Dan for sharing all those wonderful insights into his work. Um, and thank you to um, our attendees too. This is the first time we've done anything like this. Uh, Laguna, this is a debut for Laguna Art Museum to do a, a live event. We've been uh, creating many virtual experiences uh, during this, this, uh, this pa the, the pandemic period um, because we, we want to keep our presence out there and um, do plenty of outreach, but it's, it's been recorded. Um, this is the first time we've done a, a live event, and um, I think it went pretty well. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I am personally very delighted, and I'm um, encouraged to do more, because even after we reopen the museum and get going again, we'll do more of this kind of thing. Um, we've, we've, we're getting the hang of it. So uh, thank you for indulging us, um, uh, our audience, in, um, in any uh, technical difficulties we might have had. Um, we'll, we'll get better and better at this. Um, so thank you. I'd like to thank Malcolm and especially Robert for making this happen. Very much appreciated. Dan, yeah, you were great. Thank, thank you so much for your time tonight. This has really been fascinating. Your time and your good humor. And most importantly, the humor and the beauty that you give us through the art objects that you make. Are really, really wonderful. We need more people like you on the planet, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and by yeah, the way, yeah. by the way, Rick says hi too. He's sitting hi, right Rick. <laughs> Man, what's in the world? <laughs> all right. Well, until we can all meet again in person, I wish everybody a good night and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. So bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.